Heavenly Father, we are looking at some challenging moments in the life of uh, your children, Isaac, Rebecca, Esau, Jacob. Lord, we pray that in their life, we will not see only the negative, but we will see you fighting for them to bring them closer and use them as lights in that specific world. We pray that you will do the same with us in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Genesis 25 and 27, in between is Genesis 26. I drew the chiastic structure so we understand what is going on. In Genesis 25, as you will see, the second part of the chapter, we have a very interesting description of Isaac and Rebecca praying for children. And lo and behold, the blessing comes, Rebecca conceives not one, but two. Then, almost in an abrupt manner, we get to know that uh, there is a difference between the two. They are very different in many ways. And there is something about Jacob's attitude toward his brother that reflects the name he has. Because one of the meaning of the name Jacob is supplanter or a deceiver. So, in Genesis 25, we have the story of the birthright. Jacob does what he does, tricks his brother. He's not too difficult to fool because he despises the birthright, the text says. So, Jacob, in the end, has it. What is interesting, again, that the story comes to a, an abrupt change. Because in chapter 26, it's not about Esau, it's not about Jacob, it's about Isaac and Rebekah and Abimelech, a king of the Philistines. Why is that abrupt change? And then... You go to 27, and the same two guys, Esau plus Jacob, come back. Well, obviously, you have a structure there. Because the way the birthright story is described, and then the narrative of the blessing, because again, Jacob supplants Esau, is obviously peril. But in between, you have a story that in appearance has nothing to do with these two stories that are given in a parallel structure. And yet there is a connection. Because here, Isaac does something weird. Something that he inherits from his father. His father twice told something misleading about his wife, Sarah. Well, in that case, we agreed it was not technically a lie, because indeed Sarah was half-sibling of Abraham. How about Isaac? Isaac wasn't half-sibling of Abraham. Rebecca, Rebecca was a cousin, second cousin, the daughter actually of a cousin, but no siblings. And yet, Isaac said, she is my sister. Right? 
So we have something in the character of Isaac that is really disturbing. I mean, this man of God just lies like that. And then in his relationship with Abimelech and the wells that are dug and the people of Gerar fighting over the wells, we almost get the sense that Isaac knows how to fight as well. So there are some elements in the story here in the middle that somehow tell us, hey, these two guys are the offspring of these here. Don't be too surprised if you see some fighting and some supplanting here because there are some character traits that are manifested here as well. Well, I will not be focusing too much on education and inheritance when it comes to negative features of our character. But it is a fact, and the Bible doesn't hide it. On the contrary, it seems to me that it is highlighted in the way the structure is given. What is beautiful, however, is that here and here, meaning before this failure of Isaac and Rebekah, and after this failure, there is a section where God speaks to Isaac, meaning God speaks to him before. Now, the way we see God sometimes is to expect him to never show up after this. Have you ever been given that picture of God? Okay, God spoke to you. But if you did this, hmm, I'm not sure God will show up again and speak to you. You're gone. But God shows up again to Isaac, and the same blessing that was confirmed here is reconfirmed here. God does not give up on Isaac. It doesn't mean God agrees to all the foolishness that humans can do at one point. But God is the God that rehabilitates, that brings you back, lifts you up if you fail. Our focus is here now, here and here. The birthright story. Please go with me to Genesis chapter 25. And starting with verse 19, we have some preliminaries. It says, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. That's a beautiful picture, right? Somebody can't have children. The husband prays for her and she conceives. But the children struggle together within her and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled, for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, 
He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Harry. Esau. But the name Esau means Harry. Harry. Afterwards, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. I think that's hilarious. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. I mean, really? That's why you love your son? But Rebecca loved Jacob. Here we have some issues. The problem is not that they love them differently. Because this idea is pretty common that you have to love all your children the same way. You can't love anybody the same way. Every child, every human being around you needs a customized way of love. But you love one and the other. It's almost impossible to compare those loves. But what the text says, and here we have a problem, Isaac has his favorite, and Rebecca has her favorite. Now, Jacob cooked a stew, and here is where the story of the birthright starts. If you look at your worksheet, you will see I have there the birthright it's a little chiasm that centers in what Esau says, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? And that section concludes in verse 34, the last sentence, thus Esau did what? Despised his birthright. So we have a double problem here. On one side, Esau doesn't really understand what he has, what the birthright is about, how he should treat that seriously. So when God gave Rebecca that, that prophetic insight with regard to the future of her two sons, God knew something. Prophetic insights that are given in advance should not necessarily be taken in a predestination kind of way, as if God predestined them to be like this. God predestined Esau to despise his birthright, and uh, therefore Jacob took over. Biblically, prophetic insights or information of the future given in advance seems to reflect God's foreknowledge rather than his predestination, meaning God knew in advance the character of Esau. God knew in advance the character of Jacob. Therefore, he decided that he will go in a certain way in history with them. Not that he abandoned Esau or gave up on Esau in any way, but for the genealogy of Jesus Christ, he decided to use Jacob. So, the story is pretty short here on this side of the chiasm. Jacob has a good sense of business. He knows how to market his lentil soup. And uh, if you have good marketing for a lentil soup and somebody's hungry, you got it. You can close the deal that same day. It's a very banal story, if you think about it. I mean, really? That's how you sell your birthright? At this point, we don't even know precisely or clearly what the birthright entails. We know later on in the Bible 
that it comes with a double portion, it comes with responsibilities as well, because if the father dies, then the oldest son takes over the responsibilities of the family, which are not few. So the birthright is rights and responsibilities. Quite often this birthright or the right of the firstborn is presented just like privilege. No, it's rights and responsibilities. But it seems that Esau says, ah, hey, I'm going to die. Would he have died, really? Oh, it's an exaggeration, obviously. But he really wants the lentil soup, and Jacob serves it to him at a certain cost. And the story concludes with God's assessment of reality. Esau despised his birthright, otherwise he would have not done what he had done. Good. With this, we jump to chapter 27. So, this was the birthright story, and then we go to the blessing story. What is pretty obvious is that there are two components to being the firstborn. The birthright and the blessing, and somehow those things can be seen separately. The story of the blessing is a long story in chapter 27. I just want to go through it very briefly to highlight some of the elements. It starts with a dialogue between Isaac and Esau, in which... Isaac asks Esau to go hunting. Remember, Isaac loves Esau. Why? Because of the game. Okay, so, so that's how it brings it back, right? That statement is made here. But here, in this other story, that concept of Isaac loving Esau because of the game, because of the taste of the game, is brought back. So Isaac speaks to Esau and tells him, hey, go get a game, prepare it the way I like it. I'm old. He barely can see. That's stated in the text. So bring it to me and I'm going to bless you. Somebody overhears the discussion. Who's that? Mom. But remember, mom had been given a prophetic prediction of the future of the two. Mom knows something. And mom looks around and says, hey, if I'm not going to step in, something bad will happen. Because this blessing of the firstborn belongs to Jacob, according to the prophetic insight that God gave me before they came out. So, just like Abraham and Sarah had some struggles when God promised, but he wasn't acting upon it the way they imagined, here we have Rebecca stressed out, and she wants to do something about it. And then you have the dialogue between Rebecca and Jacob. In that dialogue, there are some very interesting Elements. I would like to read the dialogue. It starts in 27 verse 5. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. Good. So, Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. This is a very funny statement when the mother tells the son, obey me and let's trick out your father. You may remember some stories because <laughs> it's something that can happen in families. When one parent sides with the kid, with a child, 
against the other parent. Hmm? Now they are my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. She's commanding him. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goat, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, and he may bless you, right? And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. This guy is pretty reasonable, isn't he? Yeah, but mom has everything lined up. He says, perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. The curse of the name. The deceiver, the supplanter. And I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. Very authoritarian, right? And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And mom knows what to do about them. Then the story goes on, and there's a dialogue between Jacob and Isaac. And that dialogue is a painful dialogue, because this young man comes to his father, and he has to act, he has to lie from the beginning to the end. And it is worth going through that dialogue just to see how it evolves, starting with verse 18. So he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? I mean, how, how are you going to fool your father? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. The Lord your God. See, when a human wants to accomplish something, he would take God as an ally and act in God's name. The Lord your God brought it out to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. He's confused. This is an elderly guy, close to death. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Of course, because the hairy goat, the skin was there. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son, Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. That's like a last attempt, a final attempt to, to sense it out, to smell it. Come near and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled, right? It's even emphasized, the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said. And then we have the blessing. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord 
has blessed. Of course, because it was his son's clothes. His favorite's clothes. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth. Please keep these two elements together. Dew and fatness. And fatness is expressed in two elements there, grain and wine. And then it says, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's son bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. So this blessing contains the fact that his mother's sons should bow down to him. And then blessed be those who bless you and cursed everyone who curses you. That's the Abrahamic blessing. It's a reiteration of the Abrahamic blessing. But remember, Isaac does all this thinking, still thinking, although confused, that the guy he blesses is Esau. And then Esau comes home and there's a bitter dialogue between Esau and Isaac in which Esau cries bitterly. Now this hunter, this tough guy, cries like a child. And he's not a child. He's a strong young man at this time. And uh, he asks for a blessing, and in the end, Isaac does bless him. And if you look at verse 40, 39 and 40, then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. That's why I said, Remember fatness. And what else? And of the dew of heaven from above. So this section, this first section, is the same kind of blessing that he gave to Jacob. But the rest of it is totally different. I don't want to go into details here because next week we are going to take time just to analyze a little bit these dialogues and the structure of chapter 27, in which there is blessing given to Jacob, and then blessing given to Esau. But then again, in chapter 28 at the beginning, Isaac reiterates the blessing on Jacob, now knowing that it is Jacob. What is weird in this story is that a blessing once given, even if in error, it's not taken back. Now the question is, is it not taken back because it is forbidden to take it back? Or because in the meanwhile, Isaac realizes, hey, I have just done what had to happen, but I did it against my own will. Which is a discussion that can be very challenging. So, after the dialogue between Esau and Isaac, there's a dialogue between Rebekah and Jacob again. Why? Because Jacob is in big trouble. Esau wants to kill him. So Rebecca speaks to Jacob. And then Rebecca speaks to Isaac. And that's a trick again. Because just read on and see how Rebecca brings this pathetic story to Isaac. And she says, if this son of mine, Jacob, will take a wife from among the Hittites. I don't want to leave. So Rebecca again makes Isaac 
do what she wants Jacob to do because Jacob doesn't leave just because Rebecca wants him to go to her family. When Jacob leaves, he leaves with the blessing of his father. And that's the final dialogue between Isaac and Jacob in chapter 28. Isaac calls Jacob and blesses him and charges him and says to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. As an echo of uh, the mom, the mom's words. And he tells him what to do and gives him the blessing, the Abrahamic blessing. Abraham is even mentioned in the blessing in verse 4 twice and give you the blessings of Abraham, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac, in the end, has to admit what God predicted in that prophetic insight was fulfilled to the letter. And instead of Esau, Jacob is the one that carries on the blessing and the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant that goes toward the Messiah. There's one big issue that comes later in the book of Genesis. God says in Genesis 32, 28, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. And the issue is this. If you analyze Jacob's life and Esau's life and assess their character based on their behavior as well, can you really say Jacob's character is better than Esau's character? Because the way the story is said, it is emphasizing Jacob's character flaws and Esau is the victim. As Esau says it, and I cannot challenge his assessment, he says, he's called rightly Jacob. Isn't he called rightly Jacob? Yes, he is. Why? Because he supplanted me twice. And yet, God predicted it before they even came out that he will be going with Jacob when it comes to the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, promise, blessing. And Esau, although he came out first, he's the firstborn, he will be blessed. And Esau was blessed. He became a wealthy man. So much so that when later his brother comes back from his pilgrimage and he wants to give a gift to his brother to bribe him, he says, my brother, I have enough. I don't need that. So how is God acting in history in the life of these people? And later on, he changes Jacob the name Jacob into Israel. What I notice here is that when God makes decision based on his foreknowledge, he doesn't only take in account somebody's flaw, say this is the history of somebody, right? And God knows Jacob has character flaws and makes mistakes here, here, here. At least twice we know he supplanted his brother. But then he has issues with Laban later on. And we will see some interesting dynamics as well. God, when he works in history, does not judge somebody just based on a moment. He knows the whole trajectory of somebody. And he knows in advance that at one point, 
Jacob will be fighting, will be wrestling with him. And his name will be changed into Israel. And that moment, notice well, is when after wrestling throughout the night, he gives up. He's touched in a certain way, in a certain location. All his power goes away. And all he can say is, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And that's a moment of transformation. But God obviously knew it in advance. Questions? Yes, thank you so much. So the observation was that it's weird in the description that when somebody is dying and Isaac is old, he can see well, and uh, he seems to be at the final segment of his life. It seems that everybody in his family is concerned with the will of that person instead of being there for him, helping him, loving on him, and uh, helping that passage to be smooth. My observation with regard to that is, yes, the observation is correct. Nevertheless, it seems to be Isaac's initiative to do the blessing. If you read 27 right at the beginning, it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, and he answered him, here I am. So the text doesn't give me the sense that Esau came and poked him, or Rebecca insisted, or Jacob somehow wanted to trick him. It seems that it is Isaac's initiative. He has that responsibility. We know from Abraham's story that before he died, he tried to do everything possible so that there will be no fights, no family feud among the children, because he had several. He had Isaac and Ishmael, same reversed order there as well, plus the six sons of Keturah. So he had some work to do. And the text specifies that before he passed, he fixed those problems. Now, back to Esau, a very interesting question from 28. What was the verse? Six. Let me read it because it contains something interesting there. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there. First, it seems that Esau was not that much of a rebellious guy. He respected what his father was doing. He wouldn't even have killed his brother until his father is gone. So he has some sort of uh, values, incomplete or maybe even distorted, but he kind of clings to them. So then he sees his father Isaac blesses Jacob, sends him away to his mom's family to take himself a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge. The charge is emphasized, saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So Esau sees all this. Jacob obeys. He finally obeys both parents because Rebekah does things in a way that uh, Isaac is the one, although Rebekah wants him to go there, Isaac is the one that sends him there. So he obeys both of the parents at the same time, which didn't happen before. And then the verse says, verse 8, 
also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So he's coming to his senses, if I read the text right. He sees the conversation. He understands the desire of his father. And uh, he knows his father and his mother also has a problem with the daughters of Canaan when it comes to marriage. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael. This is a close relative. Rebecca came from the family of Bethuel, Bethuel being the son of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Okay? So Rebecca for Isaac was what? Second cousin, the daughter of a cousin. Right? So then Esau takes Ishmael's daughter, Ishmael being the son of Abraham, half-brother of Isaac. So Esau marries a what? A cousin. If I read the narrative well here, correctly, and it seems to me that Esau tries to balance some things out. Okay, he's going to my mom's family and gets a wife from my mom's family. He's the favorite of my mom. I'm going to take a wife from my father's family. I am the favorite of my father. That's a very good question again. When this happens, when Esau goes to his uncle, because yes, Ishmael is his uncle, the brother, half-brother of his father. Ishmael goes to his uncle and asks for the hand of his daughter. Isn't there any tension there between them? Well, the last time we saw Isaac and Ishmael together, do you remember where it was? At the funerals of Abraham. And I believe the text emphasizes this for us to know that they were in good terms. When their brother passed away, Isaac and Ishmael, in spite of all the problems, because at one point Ishmael was chased away. He had to leave. And that's when I said that Abraham seems to have divorced Hagar because she wasn't back when Sarah died, so Abraham married another woman, Keturah. Right? So from the story, I get that at that time, at least superficially, Isaac and Ishmael were together. There's something very interesting, and uh, I usually try not to explain the Bible with LNG White writings, but something drew my attention in her writings. She says that toward the end of his life, Ishmael came to know and to appreciate the God of his father. But later on, his descendants departed from the Lord. See, we have now this Esau marrying the daughter of Ishmael. But isn't Ishmael the father of Islam? So what sort of inner marriage is this here? Is a God-believer marrying a non-believer in this story? Well, one of the mistakes we can make when we read the biblical text is to read history, later history as we know it, back into the text. First, one observation with regard to Ishmael being the father of Islam. If you ask people that embrace that religion, they will tell you Abraham is the father of Islam. 
not Ishmael, Abraham. And if you want to dispute that away, it's very difficult because Abraham was the father of both Isaac and Ishmael. Now, at that time, we don't have Islam. Islam as a religion appears in what? In 5th, 6th century AD with the Quran. Of course, the Quran takes some stories from the Old Testament, including the story of Abraham, and Ishmael is emphasized over Isaac. So then, to this day, the dispute over Canaan, the territory that was given to Abraham, is based on Abrahamic grounds. Because just the way the Jews say Abraham is our father, the Muslims say, no, Abraham is our father. So whose father is Abraham? Because biologically, Abraham is both, right? The father of Isaac and of Ishmael. And if you take the biological inheritance, the birthright, who would have the biological birthright? Ishmael. But God switched it. So it's different now. Okay? Back to Esau. Esau takes one more wife. Clearly we have to do with uh, polygamy here. Or polygyny. When somebody has multiple wives. Because there's polyandry when somebody has more husbands. And there are, even today, there are parts of the world where that is a practice. Or polygyny, which means multiple wives. So Esau is clearly polygamous. But is Jacob any better? Because he will end up polygamous big time. He will marry Leah first, tricked, of course, but he's a trickster too. <laughs> Pretty complicated history, isn't it? And then he marries the love of his heart. And then the servants of those two wives, and at least one of them, Bilha, which is the servant of Rachel, she is also called a wife later on. But we will come to that later. So Esau here marries somebody from his father's family. It seems to be some sort of balancing things out. Okay, I'm going to listen to my father and I'm going to take somebody from his family. I don't want my father to die with a heavy heart. And Ishmael is his relative his half-brother, I'm going to take somebody from there. Please notice that at this point, Ishmael is blessed in the Abrahamic covenant just like anybody else. The only difference between Ishmael and Isaac is that it's Isaac that carries on the lineage. But in Abraham, all the families of the earth we're going to be blessed, all the more so his own family. So Ishmael is not bored out, and that's what, what I'm trying to break down here. Ishmael is not eliminated. Esau is not eliminated. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to being blessed by God, no, they are not eliminated. They are not even marginalized. But God has the right in history to act based on his own judgment and decide whether from my family he will use me in a certain way or one of my brothers. He has different destinations, different roles to fulfill in history for each one of us. And for Abraham's son Isaac, he had that destination. From Isaac's sons, he had destination, that destination for Jacob. And from Jacob's sons, he had the 12. 
he only had Judah, the one that carried on that lineage, it doesn't mean that all the others were cursed or eliminated or barred out or neglected in any way. What we have later in history, this constant tension between the descendants of biological descendants of Isaac and biological descendants of Ishmael, those are relatively recent in history. If you go further back, you will see that there was knowledge of God in uh, those peoples of the East where we had Ishmael first, but we also had the sons of Keturah, the other six brothers, half-brothers of uh, Isaac, because before Abraham dies, he sends them all eastward. Does this mean that your life is predetermined by God. And in a way, from a human perspective, the answer can be yes. From a bigger perspective, I believe the answer is no. And for that to be understood, I will have to separate divine foreknowledge, divine foreknowledge, God knows things in advance. It's not only divine foreknowledge, it's divine all foreknowledge. So he knows everything in advance. Because he knows everything in advance, when you look back and you analyze your life, your own life, just like these patriarchs could analyze their own life, you could easily come to the conclusion, man, God, God kind of just messed around with my life because he knew it from the very beginning. He predetermined everything. So I was just uh, playing the game he pre-established. Nevertheless, there is a very important element in the equation, which is your willpower and your ability to decide. Now, you can stay in God's plans or you can rebel against God's plans. If you stay in God's plans, it's not like God cancels out your willpower. It is God working with your willpower. And your willpower united with God's willpower make decision after decision in life, but your willpower is there. It's like you, if you had a good father, a father that really cared about you, if you went to your father and asked the advice of your father, you cannot tell later on that uh, my father predestined me for this or that, Based on that love relationship that you had with your father, you made decisions informed by the wisdom of your father. But it's your decision in the end whether you are going to follow the wisdom, the counsel of your father or not. So similarly on a larger scale, a human being that submits to God's will is not a will-less human being. It's not somebody that is uh, deprived of that human component that is essential for humanness to be able to decide pro or against, for or against God. Because that's what you see right at, be at the beginning. Adam and Eve had the possibility to choose for God or against God. So it seems that this freedom of choice is something intrinsic something built in in a, in a human being. God doesn't take that out. God, knowing everything and loving you, can inform you with regard to the right decisions you're making or you should make. If you submit to His will, then you will go in the right direction and you will enjoy the benefits of making the right decision. But as you can in, see in the life of Jacob, Jacob didn't always make the right decisions, just like Isaac didn't make 
always the right decisions. Abraham is no exception either. But God continued to work with them and shape his story. The shaping of his story is not canceling out your will. The mere fact that God changes circumstances around you, around your life, and tries to channel your life in a certain direction does not mean he pre-established. Because at one point, you can say, no, I don't want to have anything with him. And he will not force you back into that relationship if you don't want to. But again, when it comes to a personal analysis, sometimes it's very hard to say that uh, your life was not pre-established in any way. But it's not a predestination in a sense in which you would be doomed or forced or um, pushed without you being able to decide in a certain direction. That's how I see it from the Bible. We have to close, but again, great discussion. Lord, yeah, intricate, complex, indeed complicated are your ways. And sometimes we just marvel to see how you have worked in history, in your children's history by and large, and in our own history. But what we can say again is that great and marvelous are your works. And our heart, our mind appreciates that. Thank you in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.